Add list. This is a, a new space um, for researching creative activity here at FCAD. So um, we're very excited to have our very first uh, guest speaker, uh, Ezra Winton, uh, who will be talking about. Um, Ezra and I were talking over the last few months, and we I don't know how we got onto the topic. I'm going to mention to you that the Hot Docs Festival had gifted or donated um, some archives to the university and the university library and their special collections. So I think it was actually during Hot Docs itself, you and I walked over, wasn't it? Yes. And maybe after I walked over and talked to the archivists and, and looked at the stuff and spread out all the stuff on the table and figured out if there was something interesting to be said. So I don't know if there's something interesting to be said, but that, that's kind of. <laughs> Sorry, is it locked? Uh, no, it should. Oh, okay, it slides. <laughs> so, so that so that was kind of the genesis of this, and this is uh, this, oh, one of one of the reasons why uh, Ezra is before us today. Anyway, let me um, let me uh, more formally introduce uh, Ezra Winton. He's a as, um, a number of you uh, know him. Of course, he's a curator and a critic. He's a teacher, and right now he's a visiting scholar at Lakehead University, where he researches film festivals. We'll be talking a bit about that today curatorial practices, politics, screen ethics, Canadian cinema, and Indigenous film and media. He's finishing a book that looks at the commercialization of documentary film festivals um, with uh, Hot Docs, the festival here in, in Toronto as the case study. And the title of that book is Buying In, Selling Out. That's coming out with McGill at Queen's University Press. Uh, Ezra is also co-editing a collection with uh, an essay collection with uh, Lakota artist Dana Claxton entitled Insiders Outsiders the Cultural Politics and Ethnic uh, sorry and Ethics of Indigenous Representation and Participation in Canada's Media Arts that's a Wilfrid Laurier Press he is co-editor of the soon to be released two volume collection documentary film festivals from Paul Gray uh, and that's with uh, Ida Vallejo and he is also co-editor of Challenge for Change, uh, activist documentary at the NFB that came out in 2010. Awesome book, as is, I read this one too, Screening Truth to Power, a reader on documentary activism um, that came out in 2014. Um, Ezra is also co-founder and director of programming at Cinema Politica, the world's largest documentary screening network. And he's also a contributing editor at POV Magazine. So welcome, Ezra. Thanks, Greg. Um, I clearly have a lot of co-editing <laughs> credits and don't need any more. Actually, for anyone who wants to work in uh, academia beyond studies, co-editing credits are really good in Europe, but not so good in North America. <laughs> just, just a little job tip. Um, OK, so thank you for inviting me to this new space that's still in production. Uh, and thanks to Essen and Jackie, wherever Jackie is, I guess he's out there, um, for all the wrangling. I'm going to just uh, talk a little bit about the projects that I'm doing, and especially the one that relates to this. And then I'm going to talk about researching festivals, um, about archives, obviously, and then a little bit about um, just some of the kind of guideposts concepts that I'm working with and then I'm hoping I have three kind of questions to throw out at everyone at the end and I hope we can uh, spend more time talking as a group than listening to me talk um, but I'm curious to know how many of you are researching film festivals okay and how many archives so using archives or doing uh, research uh, or like critically assessing archives, like looking through, talking about what archives mean and how they operate, or you're just using archives to research? Both? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah? Yeah? Okay. Um, so just, just uh, you know, um, to start off, I'm not, an, I'm not like an archive specialist, and I'm not, I'm not up on the, you know, the current hottest literature that's looking at um, archive uh, theories and, and methodologies, uh, but I am researching, I have been researching uh, the Hot Talks Film Festival for a long time, and as such I've engaged in doing archival research, and most lately here at Ryerson looking at the, the archives that were donated here at the, at the university. So 
Um, just very briefly, just so you are oriented to what I'm doing and why this matters, or at least why um, hot docs and the archives matter, and maybe how it fits in with everything else I'm doing. Um, at Lakehead, I'm researching the ways in which documentary film can envision and prefigure alternative futures oriented to social justice. And that's uh, called Next Docs. It's around documentary futurism, and it's part of a, a larger project. Hi, Alex. Hi. Um, and um, I'm also looking at the ways in which cinema reflects and advances colonial agendas in a, another project called Settler Frames. I'm a curator in residence at Concordia's Fine Arts uh, faculty, conducting a project called Settler Frames. And there I've been going through the, uh, the film archives, 35,000 titles. I watched about, um, I don't know, I watched about 100 films out of the 35,000. So a fairly decent sample. And in that work, I'm looking at the ways in which uh, settler identity is constructed across settler cinemas. And, um, have developed, uh, have kind of extracted from that work three archetypes, the benevolent settler, the malevolent settler, and the liminal settler, and that's part of a, another project. Um, and then I'm finishing my book that's based on my B PhD dissertation, which looks at the commercialization of documentary film uh, at film festivals, and Hot Docs, as Greg mentioned, is my case study. So in the book, each chapter leads with a, uh, an ideological critique of an opening film of the festival. And opening films at festivals are their own, they're their own beast, they're their own category. They're designed to do things differently than the rest of the program. It's a, usually a completely different audience at opening night. It's made up um, of people who maybe will only see that one film. It's also the, the way that the festival can launch through media. And they're generally, you know, they've been called, they get called softball films or crowd pleasers. And that's generally the strategy of most festivals um, is to show something that's not going to, uh, especially in the doc documentary world, that people aren't going to go home depressed and cry themselves to sleep after watching. Um, so I think they're interesting films to, to actually look at. Um, and what I've done is I, lo I looked at the last 20 years of programming because my, well, I'll show the slide later, but um, up until 2013, because that's when I finished my PhD. And so I chose, uh, I've chosen films from that period and now I'm adding a chapter that's more recent. And so the, the films are Palm Wonderful, The Greatest Movie Ever Sold by Morgan Spurlock, um, which highlights uh, larger socio-political economic forces of commodification, um, and that's from 2011. From 2010, it's the French mega hit Babies. I don't know if anyone's seen this as its own app. Um, very cute, adorable film that I uh, argue highlights uh, the socio-cultural economic forces of cultural populism. Um, Ai Weiwei, Never Sorry by Alison Clayman from 2012, which I argue um, highlights the liberal politics at play at film festivals like Hot Docs, and also highlight something that I call dissent tourism. Um, and then the last one is from 2017 by Lana Schlesik called Be Nation, which in the last chapter that I'm adding to the dissertation chapters, uh, I'm arguing highlights issues of colonialism at film festivals. So that's the, the research around Hot Docs. Um, and I guess before well, I, that that'll just take me into talking about researching film festivals. So I've got this little um, coggle that I've done up there that I've shown before at conferences, and it's really just I need to actually add a whole bunch of things to it. But it really is just a visual representation to show the complexity of a film festival as a cultural institution, as a constellation of sites, as a series of events. Um, as a as a social environment, um, as a political economy, as a whole bunch of different kind of overlapping, interlocking layers that are social, cultural, economic, and um, the dotted lines just basically uh, connect. And and there should be way more of the dotted lines, but it just gets you know it'll like make you dizzy if you look at it too long. But it just shows how different 
aspects of the festival that maybe seemingly aren't connected are indeed connected, such as, um, you know, one, one thing that's, that every festival will tell you is that programming has nothing to do with the financial structure, with, with sponsorship. And I've put dotted lines between those things because I think we can't, we can't actually believe that there's no influence by, by the funding of any cultural institution on its cultural output, in this case uh, with festivals, it's the programming. So, um, so the, some of the, the questions that, that, uh, that I consider are what are the main obje objects one studies at a festival, not just me, but anyone who's gonna study film festivals. Uh, there's the films and filmmakers are the most accessible. So it's, it's really interesting that a lot of festival studies actually, uh, there isn't a lot of study of the films. There's a lot of discussing films and film programming, but you don't find a lot of close readings of films. And I think uh, that's really interesting because one of the things that I'm interested in my research uh, is values. So how are values articulated by cultural institutions? How are they, how are the, the three levels of, of value articulation? How are they, how are they formulated and presented? The first one's internal. So the value system of the organization is internally articulated at board meetings and between management and staff. And then there's the outward one to the public, outward looking, public facing uh, set of values that comes out with the programming. Um, and then there's the value system that's communicated between, uh, between festival management and funders. And I, I think all three are different, even though they're obviously related. Um, and so the films can actually tell us a lot about the values of a festival um, and get, get to its essence and what the festival is about, um, what it's trying to say, its messaging. And so I think it's curious that we don't do more kind of close readings of the films and do critical, critical readings of the films when we're doing festival studies, um, because really, the films are the main currency of film festivals. Um, and, then, and then the other thing is obviously the filmmakers who, um, who we may or may not have access to depending on our positionality in the festival world. Um, and there's management and staff at film festivals, but I discovered early on um, when I interviewed five of the top, the top five people working at Hot Talks and uh, of their management that inter, I mean, par part of it is I, I asked the wrong questions. I think it was early on in my research and I was like, is it about art or business? And you know, everybody said it's about both. Um, but I think that the people working for a festival, they're not gonna give you the critical insight that, that you're maybe looking, that one is looking for when researching. So I think there's also challenges there. Um, and in terms, on, on that note, I do wanna like say that Hot Docs has been very generous with me in granting me access to the festival, in sitting down with me and, and talking on very, about various issues of the festival. It's just when, when we did the formal kind of research interviews, they, I, I couldn't really use them in my in my dissert, I barely use them in my dissertation and probably won't much at all in the book or haven't much. Um, so my research, like a lot of festival research involves first person experience at festivals. And through these interactions, uh, research develop, researchers develop amicable relationships with festival management and staff, which in turn, I think makes it more difficult to form an objective and critical stance. So I'm really, you know, if it's not already obvious, my I'm interested in approaching festivals from a critical standpoint. And that's because um, there's always room to critically engage cultural institutions. And in particular with documentary festivals, there is a um, an aspect that we need to consider that's different from fiction festivals. And that is the, the claims on veracity and the engagement with social reality and issues of social justice and lived experiences of subjects in the films. Um, and there's, there's often various power imbalances which are, which are reinforced and rearticulated at, at the site of the festival institution that aren't always acknowledged. And I think we can um, look closer and more critically at 
at these institutions, uh, at festivals in general, and and why I'm kind of starting with these these uh, what there is to research kind of questions is because I'm getting at why trying to figure out why there hasn't been more kind of critical festival research and publishing. So I think those those relationships that are built, it's this has been like described as you know the insider outsider binary with with people studying festivals from the outside versus people people from the inside um, and and the people on the inside how they um, they reinforce those relationships which are possibly friendly amicable relationships so for instance I'm very critical of hot dogs but I know the people who work at the festival and they're uh, a lovely collection of very um, nice human beings that that my critique isn't a personal attack on but I think this is another problem with doing critical research on something like a documentary festival is that it can feel like a personal attack when it's really um, trying to critically assess the institution as a whole and so how do we do that without without compromising those relationships or how do we have relationships that aren't compromising our, our research so I think that's another um, challenge because most of the people I know that study festivals they, they either work at festivals or have worked at festivals or they go to festivals a lot because a lot of the research is as I said based on first person experience um, so there's also the studying of uh, festival ephemera and communication objects such as programs posters and press releases and I think analyzing these objects helps to discern the festival's public-facing official discourse and helps to gain a sense or tone of a film festival, but um, I, it's not enough, obviously. And so here in the Ryerson Library, like, what, what part of the library is it in? It's in Special Collections. Special Collections. Um, their uh, Hot Docs made a donation last year, Greg, right? Yes. Last year. So they donated um, archives to to Ryerson, excuse me, which I've looked at, and um, these these archives are incomplete. They're partial. They're a fragment of a larger story of the cultural institution, and that's why I'm calling this this talk parts of story. Um, and it, I think every archive is a fragment, is a part. There's I don't know if there's anything such thing as this com total complete archive, especially if we consider, um, you know, some of the more recent uh, ideas around archives of feelings and archives of experience and how those are incorporated into material archives and how the stories that can be told around, you know, a, a call for submissions that went out in 1972 that elicited a huge controversy in the community the piece of paper that's maybe found that has the call for submissions will just tell you that there was a call for submissions but the the archive of experience and feelings around that object will tell a different story so i think it's always about parts of story and our job as researchers um, engaging with archives especially film festival archives i would say um, is is how to uh, make these archives work for us and how to how to fit them with other parts of the story so the hot dogs archives it's mostly um, ephemera it's, it's mainly posters um, pr like print print uh, printed objects printed objects objects on paper whatever th that would be um, so pamphlets and flyers and and broadsheets press releases um, but there's also uh, <clears throat> there's also uh, compendiums of media coverage from, for instance, the, I looked through the 2017 compendium, which is a big uh, binder of um, of a list of basically all the media coverage of the festival, all in quotes, um, because in there I discovered right away that there was uh, things missing, including three articles that I had written. So I had every single POV article, every single POV article that was published except for my three. One of which was a very positive article, by the way. Um, so that, that led me to 
actually realize what else is missing. And that's what actually got me thinking about what is this is this is an object that's not outwardly facing, it's not publicly facing, it's actually given to the board and passed around internally. And sure it's meant to represent like what a good job the festival is doing because of all this positive media coverage. But when it's put into a public archives, it becomes public facing and then we can engage with it as the public. Um, but this is why I think we need to engage with these archives and objects critically, which is um, always considering, are, is it a part of the story? Which part of the story and how does it fit? And what's missing? What are the other parts? Um, okay, uh, so I guess uh, doing research uh, around festivals too, um, if you're a member of the community like I am of the documentary community as a, as a programmer of documentary, and someone who writes about documentary outside of writing about film festivals, there's also my positionality to consider and whether I'm a stakeholder, whether I'm part of the stakeholder group that's associated with hot docs. Um, I've thought a lot about what is the hot docs community, what is the public that hot docs uh, creates around the festival, and, um, and how am I a stakeholder in that community, and how does that subjectivity of me being a, a stakeholder affect the research that I do um, on the festival and to constantly, I guess, remind myself of that and and the, and think about those relationships as I do the research. Um, <clears throat> so generally I'd say with festivals there's a lack of cohesive archives. I mean this is when 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 reading the literature that's out there, people that have done festival research, this is pretty much not just uh, with hot dogs, but it's a, a general, um, a general uh, problem, is a lack of cohesive archives, both internal, such as memos, board agendas, and budgets, and external, such as programs, press releases, budgets, again, because there's the internal budgets and then there's the ones that we can access. So it means that setting festivals is a huge challenge um, to, to actually just find the basic material objects. So when I was doing research for my PhD and I went to the hot docs head office and I said, can I see programs from the first five years of the festival? They didn't have them. Um, so I couldn't, there, and there was no record online about what, what had been shown in the first years of hot docs when it was still under the management of the Canadian, uh, well, what, what has become DOC, the Documentary Organization of Canada. And so I, I was hearing stories from different filmmakers that they were at different screenings and this film would screen, but I couldn't put together a complete picture of the programming. And so one thing I wanted to add in terms of, you know, parts of story and looking at the official archives, the official archives being the ones that are donated at, at, here at Ryerson, and then also the official archives at, that Hot Docs has at their head office, um, is that there's also community archives and collectively held and collectively constituted archives. And I think that is where we find the most rich materials as researchers of film festivals. Um, and not just film festivals, I, I'm guessing other cultural institutions. So when I couldn't, uh, when I was missing basically seven of the programs, um, I put an email out to the documentary listserv and they were all mailed to me by different members of the documentary community across Canada. And then suddenly I was the only, I, I thought I, I may be wrong, well probably I'm wrong, but what, let's say one of the few only people with the complete programs archive. So I had every single program, that, like original program in my possession and was able to then put them all in a database and, and then that's how I was able to, to come up with this graph because I, part of my, part of my, res sorry, I told you my movement would just be like this, but I'm just going to get up um, So part of my research of hot docs is analyzing programming. And so this is, I, I've now done, I've now done the last five years as well, but I don't, I haven't plugged it into a graph yet, but it will be in the book. But this is basically <clears throat> Canadian programming is blue, um, American programming, is green, and this is just the total programming. Um, so it's you can see that 
you can see that in the beginning there was no American films programmed at the festival, and then in 2013 there was uh, 50. And the, this is the total programming. So this, this, these two plus the rest represents all the programming, including international programming. And you can see how Canadian programming was going up until uh, the until the Documentary Organization of Canada no longer had no longer was running the festival. So it went from a festival run by documentary filmmakers uh, to uh, cultural managers, which maps actually maps on around that time, or at least around if you look at the evolution of film festivals, maps on to the way other festivals shifted from artist-run festivals to um, industry-run or cultural management-run festivals. Um, so I, I wouldn't have been able to do that if I, if I didn't have the um, if I didn't have the that the archives that I that were collectively constituted, held by the community at large, and and basically donated to me. Um, it's interesting because now, very only very recently, um, these archives, uh, sorry, these programs have been actually Hot Dogs has. Um, has made efforts to actually uh, dig out the old programs, I guess, because they didn't have them when I first went there, but they must have found them in the basement um, and digitized all of them. And this is great. This is like a dream for, for any researcher that wants to look at at least the programming of the festival. And it's not, obviously, it's not just the films that you can interpret and analyze and assess in the programs, but also the institutional discourse that runs throughout so all the text that that is wrapped around the films and including the film descriptions and the way films are framed. That's all part of the institutional discourse, which then we can fold into an analysis of uh, the official narrative of the festival. Um, okay, so uh, one, one, one last thing on researching festivals that I also am just, uh, it's very frustrating that this this is, continues to be a problem. I'm trying to address it from the PhD version of my research to the book version, but that's political economy analysis of film festivals is just non-existent. Uh, there's so little of it. Excuse me. And I think that uh, that there's it's partly because there's a challenge to access financial information, even though a lot of these festivals are publicly funded, um, and. I think it's also uh, partly because of the way, the ways in which um, academics interface and actually frame and consider film festivals, and that's a small community-oriented and alternative uh, media institutions and creative institutions, um, including myself, which is that you know film festivals are um, annual showcases of of films that you you normally wouldn't find on, on other mainstream platforms for the most part, at least with hot dogs. In documentary, there's very few platforms now left for documentary where it's easy to just access. And so that is an alternative to mainstream television and the Megaplex, for instance, where it's less than 1% of programming at the Megaplexes in Canada is, is actually documentary. And less than 5% is actually Canadian. At the megaplex in Canada, so outside of Quebec, um, so uh, I think that this idea that they're that they're small and they're alternative, that you know that they're uh, that they're not Hollywood institutions, that they're not part of this like industry that's so maligned through that that has been like politically political economy to death, um, that there's very little political economy analysis of, of film festivals, so. I'm, I'm trying to uh, address that because I did. I myself contributed to this lacuna in the research with my dissertation, but I'm trying to add a layer of political economy to the book version. And so I've been looking at the the festival's main sponsor, Scotia Bank, um, and it's really interesting because I naively thought it wasn't worth looking at because it's a small bank that doesn't matter, but it turns out it's actually a huge bank. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, it really matters what Scotia Bank does in the world. Um, and thinking about how that bank, how the financial institutions that have kind of um, 
incorporated the edges of culture and brought them into the mainstream with their funding and their marketing, how those financial institutions like RBC and Scotiabank, how they benefit from those relationships. Um, and that stuff you just won't find in archives, at least publicly available archives. So um, that kind of thing is a lot more difficult to do. And that's why I think there's a less political economy analysis done of film festivals, but we hopefully we can talk about that more later. Um, so um, in terms of thinking about uh, archives and official narratives and institutional discourses, I see three major challenges to compiling, presenting, and analyzing the whole story of most film festivals. Uh, and I would say the larger the festival, the more difficult, in fact, because the smaller the festival, um, the more community oriented and community responsive they tend to be. Um, and, and, that, and that affords more access and more transparency for researchers. So I, I have found the larger the festival, the more these challenges are expounded. So the first one is navigating, navigating institutional discourse or navigating the official narrative. Um, the second one is that communities associated with festivals are generally supportive and reluctant to go on the record. Uh, with contrary or critical information that contradicts official narratives or at the very least helps a researcher compile an alternative or parallel narrative. So when I was conducting my research of hot dogs years ago, I interviewed a lot of um, staff who did not want to go on record, for instance. Um, the third one is scholarly research has not fully probed the inner workings of these institutions, so there is little preceding deep tissue work to turn to when conducting new research. And this is especially true concerning the ways in which film festivals are funded and with regards to internal policy and mandate decisions. So uh, I would love if anyone could tell me the official policy of any film festival on anything. Uh, and we'll all be very uh, challenged to do so because they don't have policy. They have unwritten policy. Um, and one of the things, I, like one of the things yeah, one of the unwritten policies of uh, hot dogs, for instance, that I've heard, but I don't know if this, you know, I, 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 I've seen effects of it, so I don't know if this is an actual policy or not, but it's definitely not been written down. It's that the festival takes money from certain consulates and not others in Toronto. And so where is that policy? How, is, how are those decisions being made? Are they just personally... Uh, decided upon by individuals at management level, or is there a policy? What's the policy on corporate responsibility, um, on ethical representation, and those types of things? And Hot Docs is not alone on this. This is like across the board with most. Um, and, and for me, it's I, I think the pressure for the policy is on the larger festivals because they actually, you know, Hot Docs has a staff of 50, 50 to 75, TIFF has a staff of 300. I mean, these are Hot Docs' budget is over $6 million. These are festivals that can afford to actually develop policy, to spend the time and pay staff and work with, work together to develop policies where I don't think the pressure is, um, it's harder to put that kind of pressure on smaller festivals that are underfunded, understaffed, overburdened already. And also those smaller festivals, I think, are also can be more responsive, or at least we can access them sometimes easier. But can we can we can talk about it more later as someone with a lot of direct experience um, I think they all need to be sampled. yeah <laughs> event eventually sure eventually sure uh, so um, so when we when we do have archives to work with such as the ones donated to Ryerson uh, by hot talks last year the question is how do we best put them to work in the service of, of festival research or creative industries research how do we productively approach them as parts or a part of a story? And uh, so for me, the, these archives here are they're like piece, they're a piece of a puzzle, not an exhaustive or thorough blueprint for, for the institution. Um, and uh, so the items that the items that I mentioned earlier that were donated, uh, they represent, embody, and reflect the official narrative of the institution. They are the material art articulations of the institution's mandate values and strategies, both internal and external. So 
um, we do have a starting point. You know, it's when you're staring at one of those objects that's a program or that's a poster, uh, I think we need to step back and think about how it is communicating the mandate values and strategies of that institution. Um, and that it's not just a piece of graphic design work or a collection of words, for instance. Um, so it's up to us as researchers to assess such parts of the story with critical lens to realize the quality of what has been donated, to question the selection or even the curation of the donated items, and to see how they fit into the larger puzzle. And I think this is where I bring in curatorial ethics and curation because archives are curated. Um, they're never not curated or seldomly not curated. They're mostly curated. Um, people decide what, uh, what goes into the archive and what doesn't go in. Um, they don't always decide what doesn't go in because maybe it's missing. Um, but certainly in when archives are donated to institutions, there's been a decision about what gets donated. It's not just, hey, we have the six boxes in the basement. It's let's, let's donate this and for these reasons. And, and thinking about that, that the, the active agency in the curatorial process to select and reject certain items, the way certain films are selected and rejected, actually reflects and embodies the values, strategies, and mandate of the cultural institution that we should always, always keep that in mind. <clears throat> so these archives, therefore, no, uh, no matter how comprehensive or partial they may be, help to bring shape to the story of hot docs as an institution and public events and a, a series of events and, and constellation of sites. Um, and, and it's interesting to see how they fit with other parts of the story or not. Um, and this is one of the things that I'm sorting out by looking through the archives here at Ryerson. Um, yeah, so as an assembler of parts, which is kind of what uh, what happens when you're engaging with, with, with partial archives, or let's just say archives, because they're all going to be, for the most part, partial. The researcher is interpreting the history of the institution as well, and, and as the case of most festivals, the origin story of hot dogs is complicated, contested, and difficult uh, to be conclusive about, and archives um, just add, I think, to that inconclusivity. So you need to be very attuned and attentive to um, the various competing narratives um, about often when a festival becomes popular, becomes successful, the origin stories become very muddled because uh, there's various people staking claims to this successful popular event. Um, and sorting through that in archives is really, uh, it's really interesting. I have, I have all the, uh, I have the first three years of all the meeting notes from the, the, the group that started Hot Docs that were sent to me, not by Hot Docs, but by a member of that group. They had them on a CD-ROM, I think, mm -hmm. uh, that I managed to extract. Um, not like riveting reading, but there's, there's interesting discussions and debates. Um, and, and it also is a part of a story because, you know, when someone's taking notes at those meetings, other things are left out, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, just maybe I'll say a couple, a couple things about the, um, the kind of conceptual guideposts around looking at these archives and doing uh, film festival research. And then I have these three questions to turn over to everybody. Um, so I already talked a little bit about institutional discourse and how um, archives that come from institutions, I think, uh, represent uh, official narratives from those institutions and therefore comprise institutional discourse, however partial or complete. Um, and we need to think of them that way and, um, and think about how to put them in contradistinction or in communication uh, with collectively held and constituted archives. Um, there's the question of subjugated knowledge, uh, which, um, you know, thinking about the institutional discourse of hot dogs, there's, that's, that's a, I'd say the, the driving force be, behind the institutional discourse of a festival is, is the management of the festival, the board, um, but also uh, the PR firms that the festival hires. So Hot Docs has worked, for instance, worked with the same PR firm for many years. 
Um, there's also the media, the mainstream media around these institutions that interpolate the, the festival. Um, and I would say 99% of the media coverage of, for instance, hot dogs is overwhelmingly positive. Take, if we take away the film reviews, right? Like coverage of, the, of what hot dogs is and what it does is overwhelmingly positive and probably for the most part, you know, that's, that's understandable. Um, but I think it connects in with that idea of institutional discourse. It fits with the institutional discourse of hot dogs. And so approaching that critically as well and, and understanding why that is, is it because of what I was talking about earlier, that the public that is constituted and, and formed around hot dogs, uh, the stakeholder public, that the media is part of that, like people that write about documentary and mainstream media, maybe they're stakeholders. And this is why there's a difficulty in having more critical um, distance. Um, so uh, I think this... Uh, sorry, but I'm just there's just a tiny little Foucault quote because I'm talking about <laughs> subjugated knowledge and just it has to be done. But contents buried and disguised in a functional coherence or formal systemization is one of the ways in which Foucault originally described subjugated knowledge. So contents buried and disguised um, in a functional coherence. And I think the functional coherence is the interesting part and the formal systemization. It's that's part of considering those archives as a, it's okay, um, as uh, not just contents buried, but contents missing. So buried, I think we can interpret uh, loosely here, um, buried as being invisible, being not present, um, just not not existing in the archives, and, and thinking about the ways in which they actually disrupt the functional coherence. So all the positive media coverage of a festival uh, is part of the institutional discourse and the official narrative, but if there's, you know, um, some media imprints that are really disparaging or really critical, that disrupts that, that formal, that functional coherence. Um, and why is that such a threat to, institute, to cultural institutions and, and how, can we, how can we actually work with these cultural institutions to make them more receptive, I think, and more open to to, to critical engagement and critical assessment, I think is also important. Um, so uh, cultural politics, uh, this is the main thing that, uh, that I kind of focus in on when I'm, when I'm, when I'm writing about and researching festivals. Um, so it's the Jackson quote I have is the domain in which meanings are constructed and negotiated where relations of dominance and subordination are defined and contested. So the cultural politics of a film festival uh, can reveal, like, if this is a focus when you're, when you're thinking about that definition of cultural politics, of, of relations of dominance and subordination, um, that can reveal a different or at least a variegated story of the official discourse uh, and, and, and the, the kind of the text around that uh, official discourse from media imprints. And that may expose uh, various competing concerns and objectives that inform and challenge the very nature of that official narrative. Um, I, on a last note, uh, in terms of curatorial politics and screen ethics, um, so be, be in, in the documentary world, there's a lot of discussion about ethics, and it tends to focus on the relationship between the maker and the subject. And, um, I talk about screen ethics because I, I think it's important to think about the ways in which uh, documentary artifacts move through culture and society and think about the various ethical dimensions along the way. Um, and that includes implications for circulation, exhibition, reception, and archivize, archivization. Um, and it also brings to mind one thing that I talk about in, the, in my writing on hot dogs, which is capital versus community programming. Um, and capital, <coughs> capital programming is programming uh, with a mandate or a strategy towards exchange value, and community programming is uh, programming with a mandate or strategy towards use value. And in community programming, it's the question of how can stakeholder communities, um, and we're talking about social justice-oriented documentaries, 
then how can activist communities, how can communities most affected <coughs> by the subjects in the film, how can they use the film? How can they not just use the film, but how can that film have, how can the film screening have use value to those communities? Um, and I think that's in contradistinction to capital programming, which is what, what exchange value does this screening give us? Does it give us a sold out house? Does it give us positive reviews? Does it help raise the profile of the festival with certain uh, fund, funders and sponsors, with certain media, with certain stakeholder groups outside of activist groups? Um, and I think thinking back how that relates to archives then um, in terms of capital versus community strategies, we can, we can connect it back. So how do the archives tell tell these part of the story um, and and what my conclusions are is that the story that's told is one in which um, uh, documentary festivals are championing um, liberal causes that everyone can get behind like human rights and recycling and mm -hmm. more bike lanes um, and that this is uh, this is a mainstreaming of it's a mainstreaming middling that pushes out the more radical progressive political ideas that are expressed through uh, documentary films and that are expressed through the communities that are impacted in those films or by those films. And so um, that that to me, that, that capital versus community programming, that the official narrative then is that it is community programming that is actually doing a service to the the community um, because it's showing these these films that are advancing uh, a social agenda that's making the world a better place right but uh, in the research that I've done on the films and on the film screenings and on the way so the the programming the social spaces and the festival management um, I think that it's a certain kind of of community programming that is expressed but actually it's really capital programming so it's really about exchange value and not about use value. And I think the archives reflect that, the way the archives tell that part of the story. So um, I'm gonna just uh, put out uh, these three questions, but, uh, but feel free if anyone has any comments or uh, questions about what I just said um, uh, to also raise those. Should I read them all three at once or just one? What do you think? Maybe all three at once and then we can start. Okay. So, um, so uh, Jerry Zielinski writes that community-oriented film festivals are organized around some claim to group identity, whether sharply or hazily defined, and are highly sensitive to their public's opinions. So, does this describe, um, my, this is like a question for myself too, does this describe Hot Talks and how do we define, how do we define a community film festival um, and a public that's associated <coughs> with that film festival? And for those of you not looking at film festivals, I mean, we can just think about other cultural institutions, you know, um, there's lots of like theaters, museums, anything. Um, and how can institutional archives help us to do that? To kind of to 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 come to an understanding of of whether it's a community film festival um, and what kind of public is associated with it. Um, and the second one is Anne uh, Svetkovich's archives of feelings um, is largely uh, she's largely writing about LGBTQ film festivals. Um, and she writes that a radical archive of emotion in order to document um, in intimacy, sexuality, love, and activism are all areas of experience that are difficult to chronicle through the materials um, of a traditional archive. And so this is one of her ways she's defining what an archive of feelings is um, with, with particular regard to LGBTQ film festivals, but I think we can expand archive of feelings to all festivals. And how can we apply this concept to other cultural institutions? How can I apply it to hot or one apply it to hot dogs? And how will the archives uh, also help in this 
project or in this regard of approaching an archives of feelings. Um, and how can researchers work together to develop, to develop practices, tools, and platforms that advance, advance a critical approach that might include political economy analyses of funding schemes and cultural and media studies readings of power, value, community, activism, and more, especially com concerning documentary film festivals. So how can we work, how can we build better tools and platforms and lines of communication as researchers to, because the film festival, uh, film festival research is uh, fairly new, but it's, it's already quite robust. And I feel like it's, the edges are becoming very, very clearly outlined. Um, and they, they tend to not be, um, except for a few exceptions, including Antoine Damien's uh, PhD, which has just been published, they tend to not be really critical engagements with these cultural institutions. So I'm just wondering how we can um, build, make that happen together collectively. Uh, that's it. Those are my questions and the other stuff. Yeah. And thank you all very much for coming, by the way. So, any time for, for questions, if you want to grab some water or some sugary devices at the back, please feel free. Now's a good time. But otherwise, we'll open up the floor for questions. <laughs> um, yeah, so many great questions and ideas to think about. Thank you so much, Ezra. Um, I think uh, I think all the questions you raised are really vital. Um, just I have two two things that I'm thinking about. The first in relation to the last thing you just said, like so I mean, like there's systems like CADAC and shit like that that have all this information. Yeah. Right. Well, not all the information. Maybe not all the information, but like, but like they have to fill out pretty detailed financial reporting in like the CADAC system, for yeah. example. Have you attempted to talk to, you know, the, the councils and the state and the state agencies that are collecting this info to get it? Because the councils course, won't give it. They won't like release another organization's information. I mean, like from CADAC because it's so, of course the festivals are never going to release this information because they don't want anybody actually analyzing where they spend all their money, which is not on filmmakers. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, like, yeah, this I can see this being a problem that will not get resolved without sort of like other kinds of leverage and um, intervention and what what should be publicly available information, given that these entities, especially well, I mean, here in Canada, are are all funded by the councils. Um, to me, it seems like outrageous that we don't have access to this information about where these institutions are spending their money. Um, but yeah, I don't know about how to do the leverage. To <laughs> and I, to you know, that. <laughs> and I can't. Uh, I've tried to get more detailed budgets, but um, yeah, no one. Of course, wants. they're not. Gonna, they're never going to. Like they won't give them to me anyway. I mean, I doubt. I doubt they'll give them to any. You know, they won't. They won't, they won't give them to any researchers. So let's say they'll very strongly that the researcher would not use it in any way to reflect badly on them. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, I'm thinking a lot about audience to to tie together both um, you know ethics of documentary you know in terms of you're talking about screen ethics um, you know there's a there is a there is a very strong connection especially in documentary but I think we can talk about it more broadly between um, the ways in which documentary filmmakers conceive of their audiences and the ways in which festivals conceive of their audiences, especially in terms when we're talking about what gets actually funded at a high level and what will get and, and the projects that get funded at those levels that are it's necessary that it's essentially necessary to get funded at those levels to screen in a festival like all of hot dogs. And um, and I think it, it's you know it should be obvious to point out that um, both filmmakers and the fest and hot dogs the particular and other, but also other major festivals view their audiences primarily as um, white middle upper class audiences. And that uh, that this affects everything from how stories are told, uh, what stories get told, who tells them, and then, and then in the end, uh, what gets exhibited at these festivals and how the festivals construct and build an audience. Because the audience is not just who walks through the door. 
it's who you target in terms of your programming and who the mm -hmm. and what audiences the films are targeting. And uh, when you have a festival, that, you know, I, what I'd be interested in terms of like you know analyses of festivals are you know breakdowns of like who's make you know who who are films made who are films made by and and like and and analyses of the film in terms of the the, the implicit spectator that's created. Um, which is usually very, which was usually, you know, a white settler audience um, that, and, and the protagonists, the subjects on screen are usually very much other to those audiences. And the way in which these festivals essentially traffic in trauma, trauma porn um, or poverty porn um, to, 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 uh, to catch the fancy of these predominantly white audiences and what, and what that does in terms of, um, you know, what work gets elevated and what work gets even be seen. And this is, and so I'll tie this into sort of like, in terms of a, you know, a non-academic strategy for trying to um, critique and have an influence on these, these kinds of programming strategies. So um, I run, or I'm part of a collective that runs a festival called the Toronto Career Film Festival. And we're, we're, we're sort of like an up and coming festival, but we're starting to get a lot of recognition. And this, in the last few months in particular, we're getting a lot of um, co-presentation requests. And in fact, we've gotten requests this in the last few weeks from Hot Dogs and TIFF. And um, despite the fact that I, I'm very vocally and extremely critical of their programming, um, but the way in which these festivals work is, so they're screening, so like, LGBT films are like a big part of festival programming now. Um, yeah. And, um, but the way in which these festivals think is sort of like, oh, we have something that's tinged so that, that, that we think is LGBT related. So we'll just, we'll ask the Toronto Career Film Festival to sponsor it. And our response at this point is no. Mm -hmm. um, and um, at the moment we're giving excuses that our festivals in a few weeks, we couldn't possibly blah, 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 blah. blah. But that's not actually the real reason. And so what I'm doing is actually developing a strategy where, whereby we're going to develop um, sponsorship criteria that's very detailed and use that as an opportunity to take meetings with all these festivals and discuss with them uh, about what they think is LGBT programming and why for the almost ex for the most part it's extremely problematic and how they traffic in trauma porn that's and how the reasons why our audience and they want to access we're building an audience that's outside of this mainstream that's outside of this white Upper mm -hmm. class, like, and that is actually, and it's like, if you want to access these audiences, you need to actually program to them, and not use us as commodities for your programming. Just what, which is where I think your, um, <clears throat> where your analysis of what did you call it, um, capital programming, yeah. is absolutely spot on. And so, um, so we're going to try to use, you know, since they're sort of coming to us asking for favors, we're going to try to. I, I have, I have no idea. I, have, I don't actually have huge hopes that this will be effective. But this, but this is why I started the film festival, and this is, and this was the whole idea: is to model a different kind of program, to model a different way of doing things, and we'll just keep doing it um, until it becomes at least part of the conversation, and then hopefully, maybe eventually down the road, we'll actually impact all these other organizations. Uh, but I think audience is a really key, like how audiences mobilize both by filmmakers and festivals is actually completely interrelated. Um, and not separate. And yeah. I'm not talking about reception politics either. I'm talking about programming to different publics and audiences. And well, I'm and also talking about old school fucking film theory about you know so, you know spectatorship. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like it's like I'm, I know yeah. everybody hates psychoanalysis, but like we need to like this is this is not irrelevant and it's still completely uh, this is still completely important to be thinking about today. Both spectatorship in terms of what festivals create, as well as films themselves. So, just on that, if I can respond, do, Essen, how do I? Do you know how to rotate that to the left? Um, is it possible? I mean, we can all turn our heads to. <laughs> no, no, you just have to. <laughs> it used to be there. Uh, this is a appendix in my dissertation, and um, this is uh, on the twenty year anniversary. Uh, this was in the program, the 20 year anniversary of hot dogs, and oh, there it is. Yeah, okay, so talking about uh, idealization of, of audience. So, um, this is a documentary audience, and people are in like ballroom. ballroom. I don't, clearly, I don't go to ballroom events, but people are like dressed up 
people are wearing suits and ties and and in fact the the people who the, the you know the main people who present on opening night are also wearing suit and tie suits and ties in their business attire um, and I think also it just the age the demographic makeup like this is an idealization I mean this is carefully selected and curated and put in there to say you know um, something about the hot talks audience uh, and it's really hard to do audience research on festivals I mean with a huge research budget could reach out to uh, people that have been to hot dog screenings in the last 25 years and do a survey I've looked at the surveys that hot dogs does every year of their audiences um, but I don't know what's been left out because this is this is information presented to the board um, so it's like did you like the did you like the the screening room like was the theater comfortable um, there's not a lot about the well there is some about the programming but it doesn't actually reveal a lot of, about um, how they're they're constructing spectatorship and their expectations but also I just wanted to say that um, uh, in terms of the films as well 25 years of programming that's uh, it's it's thousands of films and so I have a massive spreadsheet with every film and who made because you're talking about we should look at who makes the films as well um, and it's a spreadsheet for all 25 years with tags about the subjects and I've tried to figure out how to decide whether it's political or not and this is a big problem to figure out what political means um, but looking at who made the films and the the diversity or lack of diversity of filmmakers but in terms of actually knowing the films you have to watch them and well, and it's too many to watch this is I mean this is where spectatorship theory is different from demo audience demographics right yeah I mean yeah you can do a survey you, you have to do surveys and do other statistical ways to, to capture demographics but spectator theory isn't about demographics isn't about statistics it's about you know the creative construction of who the film is speaking to and that and like and so that's why I'm thinking in terms of to the, the programming also um, you know these festivals know that white women hot dogs knows that white women is where they're making all their money there's, there's no way that they don't know that, that this and that there, there's, there isn't some information somewhere there is, would be some way to actually um, and but 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 it, and to and to extent like you know while it'd be great to have statistical information to back that up there's other ways that we can get at that and yeah. see see that in operation yeah. uh, that don't that don't have to be proven by you know a you know a large amount of funding for you know something like a survey. That's sort of where ethnography comes in a bit, and you're talking about sort of the your request for your imprimatur as a, a co-presenter. I am also thinking now about both TIFF and Hot Dogs as sort of big fests in town that lend their venue out, and in terms of sort of using their venue, they're then sort of sharing that. Well, but I was thinking, I, one, of, one of the fasts I study is Rendezvous with Madness, and so I was just at their opening night for this year and was at the opening night last year. Last year it was in the Workman Arts Space, which is in a little church on Dufferin. This year it was at the Hot Dogs Cinema, and it was so, like, so just from a sort of ethnographic sort of point of view of describing it they were so much difference in terms of who was who were there like who was there what the event felt like how it was sort of being positioned like at the pre-party there this year there were like you know little catered cups of french fries or poutine or something i don't know like last year they were dishing out popcorn from like an old pew in the church and so that's very much like you know there you have sort of this this hot dogs audience as well and i think there are to, to, you know, I, I'm less familiar with hot dogs because someone's written a lot on it, but um, I feel like hot dogs has several quite distinct audiences that they marshal in different ways. Mm -hmm. And one of the the ones that to me anyway has always been quite evident is this kind of annex neighborhood hub, mm, retired, semi-retired kind of white upper middle class progressives. And they were at this year's like rendezvous opening in droves. Like, and they, they have passes to the cinema too because they buy exactly. annual, annual memberships which is great yeah and so they're there but that's sort of like then there's that festival kind of loaning out a portion of its audience or at least really readily making that available to this much smaller more marginal one so it gets very hard to kind of track whose audience is it when you have those kinds of co co -presentation, yeah. presentations yeah as we're kind of just kind of continue the the audience thread and yeah um when did they start, when did the festival, the, the Hot Dogs Festival, start offering 
free screenings during the day too. Mm. Is it over 60 or yeah. 45? Yeah. 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 <coughs> I remember we had a festival and I was meeting some Korean um, uh, guests um, who, who were who were in town for the festival and they kind of pulled me aside and said, this is nothing like film festivals in Korea. And I said, why? And they looked quite shocked. And said, it's all old people. <laughs> 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 it's all young people, you know. And uh, subsequently, went to their film festival but, on the right. It's all everyone was under twenty-two at, at their screenings. When I was in South Africa, it was everyone was under twenty-four. So I wonder to what extent that 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 policy. Granted, there are many other factors, of course, but uh, I'm wondering if if that's something that you've come across. That I haven't looked at at it closely, but it's been in the last ten years yeah, that they've yeah. done it and. Pretty much, um, you know, I don't want to say everything Hot Docs has done is is basically following up from what another festival's done, mm -hmm. but it's pretty much when one festival, you know, gets rid of their interesting categories and makes them all universally compliable to this festival network, then the next one does it. You know, when they when they have year-round events, when they get an iTunes account, when like. Pretty much following suit what other festivals are doing. So I don't know if I, I'm, I don't know if Hot Docs pioneered the free for seniors or the docs in schools because I know they're also trying to they're they're going at both ends of the age spectrum. They're trying to build, they're trying to kind of pre-determine new audiences by doing the docs in schools so that when they get out of schools they come to the festival. Well, it's not just for seniors; it's students and seniors. Is it students and, and yeah. I, oh yeah, and the students are free during the day yeah, as well, right? Okay. But I, it seems like they don't, don't go unless them in the queues. Oh, I go. Do you? <laughs> um, you? Yeah. So this is just an obvious question, but I think it needs to be asked. Um, I'm sure you've grappled with it extensively. Um, and I guess I just want to know about this, like very neat binary you lay between um, capital programming and community programming, and when they overlap and actually assist each other. And I'm thinking specifically of the example that uh, or can they I guess is my question um, thinking about the, just the example that Kate just brought up now with rendezvous and like the very different like capital considerations of what's happened just over the last year um, kind of how you grapple with negotiating that binary and maybe not making it such a firm binary or or is it I don't know if that's the position you're taking so I, I think on the one hand uh, that you, uh, like from a normative perspective and a values perspective, that I don't agree with making money from social right. injustices. Um, that it's not, uh, like that to me is like the essence of capital programming. Um, but on the other hand, in a more nuanced reading of what capital and c community programming is, I would say I've been myself guilty of mm -hmm. capital programming not to make money from it, but trying to do this, you know, we need to get a whole bunch of people in for the first couple of screenings, and then we can depress them later um, by softballing it. Um, that I think that is a version mm -hmm. of, of capital programming, just not the kind that's right. so high profit stakes or high money making stakes. Um, but I think it really comes down to intention and values and what are the, you know, it's really easy. To, it's easier to for us to like analyze the outcomes of of these uh, unwritten policies and of these unspoken values and mandates. Um, but it's a lot more difficult to get at uh, to what they actually are and what are, what are the actual goals and intentions and what are the values of the festival. Mm -hmm. I've asked. I, it's it's something now. I'm asking more of 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 people working at festival or making making at the top decision level making especially in festivals what is what are the what are your values mm -hmm. what are your set of values around this and what are the values of the institution do they match Interesting. Um, and if they don't match why 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 are you what's happening that's so you're, sorry you're asking people who work at the festivals yeah oh wow, that's a really interesting approach. yeah and and it's something that I'm also asking my you know asking myself because it's I think I, I just feel like we don't you know, consider values, our value systems that make up worldview, that that make up the imperative of, of how films are screened and in which way and how 
um, how injustices are continue through programming of certain films in certain ways, how they're compounded. And I think if we backtrack and think about what are the intentions, you know, it's not just the mandate is to show outstanding outspoken films to the public at large. Um, and TIFF's mandate is to like provide a world, a showcase for world and Canadian cinema. I mean, those, those are like, you know, boilerplate mandates, but what are, what are the values behind those mandates? Are they to make, to make a lot of money, to constantly grow and constantly get bigger and have huge audiences to, uh, to work with different other key, key players and make them happy, you know, uh, to, to never show films that implicate your audience, um, to never, you know, do those things like what, uh, what are the, you know, that's, that's what I think is more maybe gets at like what, what capital, cause I, my examination of capital and community programming is really just looking at the whole program as a whole and, and, and the opening films are always capital program films. Um, and the Morgan Spurlock one is definitely the best example or worst, however your perspective mm -hmm. goes. Uh, I mean, it's called the greatest movie ever sold. <laughs> Uh, and it has like ads in the documentary if, <laughs> if you haven't seen it uh, it was like him saying this is the this is the way because documentaries underfunded this is what we have to do as a documentary community and on opening night he had this whole spiel and everyone was laughing and totally going along with it it seemed uh, there was no critical questions and he's saying if we don't have money to make documentaries then we need to just um, turn to the corporate world and put ads in our films and and this is how we can do it. So uh, that film personifies that kind of capital programming merging with commodification and commercialization. Shirley? Hey. Hey. Um, so this is a different track, but I was curious what you said about financial information. And I was wondering, have you gone, because they're nonprofits, right? So if they're registered charities, their tax returns are mostly freely available. And I wonder if that's something you as a way to get some of this information? So they're split into two, they're a nonprofit and a charity. And so uh, the, the, like the finances are really complicated <coughs> because, um, you know, te technically the Documentary Organization of Canada controls, uh, is it 49.5% or 51 point, I think it's 49.5% of the board. Um, and and money is it gets sent back to the Documentary Organization of Canada, um, and this has been an ongoing struggle to break free from that uh, because Doc started the CIFC, the Canadian Independent, and Independent Film Caucus, started Hot Docs, nineteen ninety three, and they started it as an advocacy organization for documentary and as a way to make money for documentary filmmakers in, and also to show each other their work. Um, and those records are really easy because, you know, they had a budget of $5,000 um, to look at how it was spent. Uh, but I have tried to, I've, I haven't, I, like I said, with my dissertation, well, oh, you weren't here at the very beginning. So with my dissertation, I, I like, you know, I'm also guilty of continuing this, this gap in the research with, that doesn't include political economy. I just didn't. I didn't do it. I did like a cultural studies analysis of the film festival. And now I'm doing, I'm trying to, to put political economy analysis in, into it, but it's mainly been me researching Scotiabank. Uh, because uh, just researching Scotiabank has been kind of insane. It's like, I could probably spend five years just compiling the data about uh, what a terrible, terrible corporation Scotiabank is so uh, and uh, and uh, I mean it's like just there's a few major facts about the financial institution that are uh, that are alarming when you learn them uh, that I at least they were like alarming to me so I've been really going down that kind of rabbit hole and I haven't uh, done I haven't done I haven't gotten to the other I've been asking for for more detailed budgets from people um, but by now, I'm also like a public figure who talks about hot docs, writes about hot docs all the time, and people aren't going to hand me stuff very 
readily. So that's why, and it may not be helpful, but just if the part that is the registered charity, basically there's open access to a lot of that data, and it's like what they have to put under the tax return, and some of it seems like some of the questions that you're asking are relevant to it. So I don't know. Yeah, it's only a small portion of their of their finances go through the registered charity. And hot, and hot Docs also, in the off-season, runs a completely different uh, documentary festival that uh, the World Association of Audiovisual Fact Industry, something that's got this, it's like a real industry, it's not, it's not a public event, so that's how they keep people employed year-round, and, and the, they've kept the, their two separate identities, but it's the same team, same organization. Um, and that's a whole separate set of finances. Yeah. Wow. Really? Of Australia too, wasn't it? It, it's a difference every year. Yeah. Is the theater itself separate financials to the also? The theater, well, it's now owned by Hot Talks. It was, um, there was a donation from uh, Rogers. So it was leased to the festival for five years and then <laughs> From Blue Ice. Oh, I just meant the operating budget for this. Like, the oh, yeah. Program. Yeah, yeah. They have their own operating budget. Yeah. So maybe we'll take a couple more questions. Yes, yeah, sure. Two or three more. Maybe just some people haven't asked any questions yet first. On this side of the room, maybe? Yeah, I know. I was looking over there, too. Yeah. <laughs> no pressure. I don't know people on this spot. Festival studies people talk a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're OK. As someone who's done investigative or archival research. A lot of it. <laughs> a little, yeah, and continues. And now I'm doing financial investigative research. Um, and I'm also a, a just recently stepped down uh, secretary of the charity. So I, if I can help in terms of getting the access to, because um, there are formal access to information requests that you might be able to do. But well, the thing I'm, I'm curious about, and it kind of loops back to the question of audience, and in terms of um, in terms of oral history research that you talked about, in terms of gathering so much more information, and just how the the boards of directors, the members of the boards of directors, may be um, some of the most useful people in terms of. Uh, this kind of narrative internally and then externally, um, you know, there's that that would be a huge question about who the audience is and how you would identify those those people. But just in terms of the leapfrogging of different board board members from a certain period, it strikes me that that would be an extremely uh, rich resource because of the um, the investment. So I'm leading to a question about ephemera versus historical value. Uh -huh. um, because the investment in the virtue of the organization in order to promote its you know, cohesive story, coherent story that you were talking about, which ensures its continued funding and existence, um, you, you would need a disinterested party uh, to be able to talk about that. A non-stakeholder. No, I, I once stakeholder. Mm -hmm. But that, okay. But there's, I feel like there's still, then there's, then their interest maybe has shifted. Perhaps, but they may also be a, a dissonant voice or an unknown yeah, voice yeah. in that. But they might have an interest that I'm just saying in like actually providing that critical insight into the institution. Or maybe they had it all along, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that's where, you know, it becomes a, almost a journalistic sort of yeah. practice where you're trying to determine whether this person, what interest they actually have in, in terms of that story. But I just, uh, I feel like that's a, um, a, just a very rich resource because it seems, I, I guess my question about ephemera and historical value, which are kind of constructs in archival practice is, or definitions in archival <coughs> practice, and your very important question, who gets to determine what is of historical value and what isn't, and what supports a overall narrative and what doesn't. Are you finding that most of what you've um, uh, you know, been able to find in this archive are largely ephemera 
like in terms of if you could do like a percentage. So if we were to classify ephemera it would be something that, as I understand it, uh, that would, is for consumption and then discarded. So when your description of some of the broad single use, are single use things <laughs> yes. and so on, uh, rather than uh, things that may be of uh, historical value to the organization in terms of its administrative history or historical value to the larger public in terms of understanding it, in terms of these these foundational conversations. What percentage would you see would be more in the ephemera? Uh, most of it. Most of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, and it's not that the ephemera is not useful to someone sure. doing archival right. research. I think the question that you're also getting at or hinting at is like how how to or maybe I'm wrong, but I think we should, like in terms of thinking about the oral histories of which, yeah. you know, I have talked, I've countless hours and I know so many stories about both TIFF and hot docs um, that uh, I've not been able to corroborate or triangulate, um, but their oral histories of people's experiences at the festivals, sometimes dating back, you know, two, three with TIFF, four, five decades. Um, how to incorporate those oral, how to complement material, partial, ephemera, a, a mainly ephemeral, uh, ephemera archive, such as the one here, with with other kinds of archival materials? I think it's a really great question, like how to build on the archive and make it more rich and and layered and diverse. It's a, it seems, strikes me that it's a predilection in, in terms of in terms of university-based research uh, that we focus on, and it, and that there are also uh, enormous difficulties with Kate and I've talked about uh, before of, about uh, the practical elements about research ethics and doing oral history mm -hmm. as regards film festivals in particular. Uh, that there's this, but it seems like there's a locus in terms of uh, potentially dissonant voices that may disrupt the. The, the more, uh, I don't want to say hegemonic, but more cohesive narrative. Uh, and I will say that like while, while I was doing the initial research, I interviewed Sean Farnell, who was the programmer uh, of Hot Docs for five, he was programmer for five years, and didn't, the interviews were okay. I mean, he mainly talked about film, mm -hmm. but, uh, and then I interviewed him after he was no longer a programmer of Hot Docs, and it was much better. Because um, he felt more at liberty to talk about some of the more structural problems with the industry that Hot Docs is a part of, but also a leader in, right? This is the important thing. This is why I pay attention to the big, the big, that's why I'm so focused on the, the biggest. It's because other, because they, they influence other institutions and the industry as a whole. So I just, just wonder if, question. yeah, mm -hmm. but I don't want to be the last if, because I can talk to Ezra. Okay, well, maybe <laughs> you can't pose your question then. Okay. No, no, do it. Do it. No, no. I, but I just, <laughs> go? Okay. Of course. Um, well, in case anybody else wants to go. Um, but then you're saying that, you know, you're lacking this, I think, because I went to the bathroom, but I think you mentioned, well, I asked Kate, um, that you were lacking a, a political economy analysis and I just in my dissertation yeah and perhaps you're bringing that more to the book and I just I don't think these conversations are outside of a political economy analysis like his job is at stake right like like that is like fundamental political economy understanding of of that interview dynamic that perhaps a cultural studies perspective necessarily wouldn't have you know but with a political economy lens that that argument is in like it's it's just there for you to pick up on and run with. I I mean it's addressed, but it's pretty quickly. Yeah. So it's like not you can't do much with it, which is that you know people working at the festival clearly are going to mo mainly um, express themselves along uh, that that coalesces with the institutional discourse because their jobs are on the line, yeah. but and or because they actually really. This is, yeah. Right? Um, so it's more like it's more like following the money. This is why, like, I know that's not all political economy does, but there's not a lot of following the money. Where does it come from, and what strings are attached, and how does it how does it influence 
the the entire how how are the how how are values compromised or how are how are values actually shift how do they change and shift possibly um, with different uh, funders when a nabob commercial plays be, right. before every single screening that looks like a documentary what are what's the political economy of you know how much do they pay to have that there but also what is the impact in terms of spectators on seeing an ad that looks like a documentary but isn't so I mean there's a lot that I think more that could be discussed in terms of the money and how the money moves around and how power is implicated in right because then I would even say that festival workers which you know is like a huge topic within festival studies like there's that like I don't know what Sean's salary was at the time but I can't imagine it was anything like Pierce's right like it and again it's not anything like Cammy's right so I mean there's when you're thinking about these lenses through political like yeah. even hot docs is threatened as a cultural institution yeah. as an like, so there is that consideration as a political economy lens I'm not trying to give them excuses or anything but there is you know there is that as well like the, yeah. the precarity of these workers who are predominantly seasonal um, the, you know the hot dogs as an artistic institution that has th you know threatened more you know maybe not as much as a, a smaller festival but yeah there could be actual like labor legalities too having signed a bunch of tip contracts over the years and I don't know if they've evolved them to have limits on talking to both media and academics at this point but like you will I think probably increasingly see signing employment contracts that you have limits on mm -hmm. what you can say to certain types of outlets outside the organization and that could very much account for how people talk about it when they're employed versus after the fact. And a lot, and a lot of the labor, like in terms of political economy, a lot of labor isn't just precarious, it's donated. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah. It's, we can't call it precarious if you're not even getting but I'm talking specifically yeah. about yeah, yeah, shot. I know. Yeah, but, yeah. but you know, for instance, like the I, whole other conversation. I know people in this city <laughs> who have written the program notes for some of right. the maybe biggest festivals here in the city who, uh, who were programmers and were paid. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. uh, and that is like official yeah. discourse of the institution. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's always something to consider that people's. Mm -hmm jobs are on the line. It's interesting because when I started, you know, and I was like, at, like really, you know, when Coca-Cola was the environmental film sponsor one year uh, for at Hot Docs, I really, <laughs> I really lost it and was really like, you know, Brett actually sat down with me for an hour and it took time and I, I have a lot of respect for him that he did that and that anyone for management mm -hmm. suffered through an hour of my, uh, my comments about Coca-Cola. Um, but I was saying, you know, you're like a leader, hot dogs is so huge, it's so important. And and I remember him saying, go out on the street in Toronto and ask anyone if they've ever heard of hot dogs. Uh, and so from their perspective, exactly. And they'd be like hot dogs? Yeah, you have, exactly. You're going to hot dogs? Um, from their perspective, they, they see themselves as an underdog in an industry that's dominated by fiction and Hollywood and blah, blah, blah. But we can, I think, you know, we can still approach them critically or any institution critically, mm -hmm. um, especially ones that get public funding. Yes. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thanks everyone for coming out Sweet. and uh, especially to Hester for a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.